Where am I? CIA Blackside. Nobody knows you're here. Why is there a green screen then? It's for fun. Well, can I get a drink of water? At least some chicken nuggets? Not until you list four movies and explain their secret agendas we never noticed. And we'll let you go and reinstate your status as a full legal doctor. Oh, that's it? All right, well, what about that guy I killed? I'll, allegedly. That was like forever ago. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, do I just start? Please. Okay, so yeah, for as long as there's been a film industry, concerned parents have warned kids that their favorite movies are trying to turn them into violent, promiscuous, Satan-worshipping commies. And well, it actually turns out that lots of movies are trying to brainwash you with their secret agendas, though half the time it's not even clear if the filmmakers are aware of it. <laughs> It's hard to imagine George Lucas having any secret agenda for Star Wars, unless the whole thing was uh, secretly teaching us a lesson about stopping while you're ahead. What? What did you say? What many people don't realize, however, is that Lucas actually has some pretty strong political opinions, and he always wanted them reflected in his films. For example, did you know that the classic anti-war film Apocalypse Now was originally his idea? And Lucas was hoping to film it during the actual Vietnam War? on location, as in real bullets flying at his real bearded face. Terminate with extreme prejudice. But no studio wanted to be responsible for Lucas' headless cadaver, so the film ended up with some other guy. You know, what's his name? He directed the movie where Robin Williams plays a 10-year-old who looks like he's 40. Anyway, Lucas instead went on to direct another film, almost as politically charged as Apocalypse Now called Star Wars. I want to hear a manly rip. Show us what you're made of. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, just, just warming up. Just clearing my throat. Unwilling to give up fully on his anti-war Vietnam sentiment just because he was doing a movie about spacemen fighting with laser swords, Lucas modeled Star Wars central conflict around what he saw as the realities of Vietnam, namely a large technological empire going after a small group of freedom fighters. Yeah, he basically saw the Empire as a stand-in for America, while the Rebellion was just the inevitable result of the overextension of its powers. So, Princess Leia is Ho Chi Minh, I guess, and Grand Moff Tarkin? More like Gulf of Tonkin. Charming to the last. All of this subversive anti-Vietnam sentiment culminated in what's considered the most childish movie of the original trilogy, Return of the Jedi. The film features a small group of technologically inferior vegetation-dwelling guerrilla fighters who manage to defeat an empire against overwhelming odds. Yeah, Ewoks are, are Viet Cong. Come on, sit down. Lucas has consistently claimed a wider political context to his films, but says nobody was aware of that. This might be due to his decision to represent years of ugly guerrilla warfare as a tickle fight between teddy bears and bumbling halfwits. But maybe it's my fault for not picking up on this galactic brain allegory when I was six. Also, turning every single background character into a toy doesn't exactly scream, build with Kipplist America. Nowadays, the West finds it as a useful tool to indoctrinate young children into the capitalist system. <laughs> For once, accusing a movie featuring a sweaty topless Tom Cruise of being Pentagon propaganda isn't some InfoWars conspiracy bullshit. With Top Gun, it's just a matter of dollars and cents. And abs. I mean, this is sick. Shame on Hollywood, shame on the CIA, shame on the Justice Department. It turns out that using military equipment, like real equipment, in a movie is expensive if you're too much of a coward to steal a few tanks from your local army base. So, in order to keep costs down, the producers made a deal with the government. They could use warplanes and aircraft carriers for a reduced price if they simply gave up a little creative control. The Pentagon's thinking was they could use the movie as an opportunity to paint the Navy in a better light and maybe even jumpstart a little recruiting action. And Top Gun's producer's thinking was probably, now we can allocate more of the budget towards additional baby oil purchases. I'm trying to not get mad here, but I mean, this is ridiculous. And since Uncle Sam had basically bought and paid for the film, the script was tweaked to make sure the military was always portrayed in a realistic light. And by realistic, they meant positive at all times. Some notable changes included ensuring all dogfights occurred over topographically ambiguous land or water so as not to anger any real life countries, making sure pilots only fired after being fired upon, toning down Maverick so he was less cocky and more of a team player, and changing Goose's death from a mid-air collision to an ejection scene because apparently the Navy wants to pretend they never crash. <laughs> I'm just going to assume that the government also demanded the volleyball scene last longer for 
morale. But who the hell knows, it's all classified. They even changed the love interest from another soldier to a civilian since there were no real female officers at Miramar, and making both lovers male would have been so hot, Navy recruitment would have just spiked right into the twilight, and there'd be no civilians left for like, you know, to be plumbers or accountants or whatever. But even without turning the movie into brokeback aircraft carrier, the Pentagon's sexy gamble absolutely worked. The movie caused military enlistment to rocket and even coincided with a jump in their national approval in polls. When it was all said and done, thanks to Pentagon assistance, Top Gun became little more than a sexually confused piece of badass military propaganda. But seriously, why did director Tony Scott go along with it? I mean, in his words, I didn't have a vision for what I was doing other than just doing soft porn. I got the guys to get all their gear off in their pants and uh, I sprayed them in baby oil. You know, actually, Tony, it kind of sounds like you did have a vision there. By the way, they didn't just test it. They sprayed them with gay bombs to quote J.R.R. Tolkien. World War Z so thoroughly deviated from the beloved source material that angry nerds were just forced to respond by making it Brad Pitt's most successful film ever. Minus a brilliant on cameo in Deadpool 2. <laughs> One of the few things the producers did actually adapt from the book was Israel's zombie apocalypse defense strategy. In both book and film, the country builds a big ass wall around Jerusalem to keep out all the undead undesirables, making it one of the only spots on earth to escape the chaos. And already you can see hints of nationalism, if not outright xenophobia. See, the guys who wanted to build a wall to keep everyone out, they were right all along. How did Israel know? Unfortunately, they make one tiny mistake. They let people in. Israelis, deciding that maybe old feuds were less important than humanity's surviving flesh-eating corpses, allowed their one-time enemies and neighbors into the wall for safety. And everybody is surprisingly cool with it. And they celebrate in the Jerusalem town square. The sounds of reconciliation and healing just piss off nearby zombies so much that they throw themselves at the wall and within minutes create a massive living flesh mountain allowing hundreds of them to climb over the wall and ultimately massacre all the revelers that's that's literally what brings down israel they let some peaceful palestinians inside their fortress and their happy singing was so odious to zombies that they learned entirely new tactics solely to make them stop singing mbop <laughs> Also, note, this is the exact opposite of how it goes in the book. There, problems arise when a few militant Jews rebel against the government for trying to be inclusive of Palestinians. They're actually unsuccessful in keeping Palestinians out, and Israel remains safe anyway. In the movie, it's because of the inclusion that the wall falls. The film's point basically becomes, it may seem like peace between Israelis and Palestinians is passable, but it'll only result in all your flesh being torn off by living corpses. We intercepted a communique from an Indian general saying they were fighting the Rakshasha. Translation. John C. <laughs> all right, skip to Angry Birds. My daughter wants to watch it tonight, and I need a solid reason why she shouldn't be allowed to. Uh, I mean, I I kind of think it's undeniably the best animated movie based on a mobile app to come out in 2016. Start talking, or you're never going to taste freedom or a chicken nugget ever again. Uh, uh, right, so despite being a laughably transparent cash grab, the movie actually boasts pretty solid animation and a surprisingly impressive stable of household name actors. This isn't starting well. Okay, okay but, but also surprisingly, Angry Birds enjoys an exceptionally staunch anti-immigration message, just in case your children haven't yet fully embraced the alt-right. Okay, better. The, the film's protagonist, Red, is ostracized by Bird Society for being just too darn angry. And when bearded, ridiculous, headwear-wearing pigs from across the sea come to the bird's little island, supposedly in peace, Nobody listens to Red's reservations. Only he believes these pigs, who have an unhealthy obsession with explosives, may have ulterior motives. Red even questions why the birds are not properly vetting the incoming immigrants, wondering, how do we know they're not criminals? What's a pig? I am a pig. <clears throat> One of Red's suspicions comes from the notion that the pigs have a king, while bird society is free and democratic. He instantly hates and distrusts these weird foreigners for being different, and he is completely right. The pigs betray the birds and blow their island to shit, and then steal all of the birds' eggs slash unborn children for food. As a result, the whole island looks like freaking ground zero, which is doubly shocking, because I have it on good authority that pig fuel cannot melt bamboo beams. Right. 
Everybody knows that. In response to this act of literal terrorism and child napping, Red assembles all the birds and trains those liberal pussies to embrace their inner anger. Presumably by just having them freely browse Facebook for like five to ten minutes. Oh, man. And once that's achieved, the birds bomb Pig Island back into the Dark Ages by repeatedly flinging their bodies at the pigs' buildings until they've leveled the entire city, which is, is weirdly reminiscent of suicide bombings, but none of the birds actually die, so I guess it's just efficient or something. It, it is a weird movie. Ultimately, there's no resolution with the pigs where they learn to accept each other's differences. It's just mindless violence and destruction. All that's left is a smoking pile of rubble with pig corpses presumably rotting underneath. In the future, birds will know just, just kill pigs on sight. That's perfect. I was explaining to my daughter she can't watch Angry Birds because it'll make her racist, maybe. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, well, I'm going to head out. So, can I have this mic, by the way? Sure, out of here. Is it this way? Yeah, uh, third door on the right. Just tell Kathy I said you're all good. She'll give you your doctor coat back and some drugs so you forget this ever happened. Kathy, you traitor! For once. Oh shit. Dave. 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 Is this? I'm worried that this is actually too hidden, too fast, maybe even too furious.